Don't forget there's three ways to support this ministry financially. Number one, you can use what we call the Yay God boxes. Little back boxes right inside the lobby as you come or as you go. You can just drop your offering in there. We don't pass a plate. We don't pressure anybody to give. If you do decide to give, give whatever the Lord puts on your heart to give, and we'll appreciate your generosity. You can also give using the QR code or the URL that you see on the screen. It's also in your program, uh, which is a secure online giving option. Or you can send a check to the P.O. Box. All three easy ways to make sure we're able to do everything God's called us to do here at Waikolo Community Church. And we appreciate your support, mahalo. Well, welcome to week two of our series, He Still Moves Stones. And last week, we talked about how God can remove the stone of doubt from your life. And you can watch that on our website, or you can watch it on our YouTube channel if you missed it. This week, we're going to talk about how God can remove the stone of fear from your life. So if you're ready to hear what God's put on my heart to share with you today, would you say, or if you're watching online, would you type, hit me with it, G, I'm ready. Awesome. So in Scripture, God tells us 65 times to not be afraid. 65 times. Why does God say it so often? It's because He wants to make sure we get it, that with God on our side, we don't have to be afraid of anything. But that's often easier said than done, isn't it? Because fear can be really debilitating. Sometimes Fear manifests as a phobia, which the American Psychological Association defines as a persistent and irrational fear of a specific situation, object, or activity, which is consequently either strenuously avoided or endured with marked distress. And according to the National Institute of Mental Health, there are more than 10 million adults in the United States who suffer from one or more of these phobias. Now, some of the more common phobias include arachnophobia, which is the fear of spiders, acrophobia, which is the fear of heights, aerophobia, which is the fear of flying, and agoraphobia, which is the fear of public space or crowds or social situations. After my gasoline explosion accident 10 years ago, I spent quite a bit of time trying to recover from pyrophobia, which is an intense fear of fire. And then we have glossophobia, which is the fear of public speaking. And it's known as the most common phobia in our society. In fact, over 75% of us say we're afraid of that. But other phobias are far less common. For example, arachibutrophobia, which is the fear of getting peanut butter stuck to the roof of your mouth. That's a real thing. And then my favorite phobia is hippopotamonstrosesquipedaliophobia, which is the fear of long words. And that's a real thing, too. Sometimes they just shorten it as sesquipedaliophobia. Now, if you suffer from a phobia, no matter how unusual it might be, I would never tease you about it, because even though many of our phobias are irrational, they're nevertheless very real to us, aren't they? A lot of people fear death in general, and mostly it's because they're not sure that there's an afterlife. And of course, the fear of death is really just the fear of the unknown. And the fear we feel causes real physiological changes in us. Our blood pressure rises, our heart rate increases. Uh, we get a real sense of panic and a desire to run away. But of course, not all fear is irrational, right? It's not an irrational phobia necessarily. I mean, if somebody's pointing a gun at you and threatening to kill you, being afraid of being shot and dying, that's about as logical and rational a fear as we can imagine. If you're in a car skidding out of control on ice at 60 miles an hour, being afraid of injury and death, that's a pretty normal and logical fear too, yeah? So we can all understand some level of fear about certain situations in this world, and yet God repeatedly tells us, do not be afraid. He tells us not to be afraid of those who want to harm us. Don't be afraid of the future. Don't be afraid of your troubles. Don't be afraid of the unknown. Don't be afraid of death. Don't be afraid of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. Don't be afraid of long words like hippopotamonstrosesquipedaliophobia. Don't be afraid of unequivocal, this is an unequivocal command by God. It's made 65 times in the Bible. Do not be afraid. So we might wonder, why does God say this? And how can he expect this of us? Because the world we live in is a scary place sometimes. And we say, why, why shouldn't we be afraid? 
And yet God's command is clear. Don't be afraid. So how can we experience the removal of the stone of fear from our lives? That's the question we want to answer today. So I'm going to start this morning by sharing one of my favorite biblical examples about fear. And it comes from the life of a great prophet of God named Elijah. And there's a famous series of events in Elijah's life recorded for us in 1 Kings chapter 17 through chapter 21, where God calls Elijah to go interact with a wicked king and queen of Israel named Ahab and Jezebel. Now, Jezebel was the daughter of a priest king named Ethbal, who was the ruler of the Phoenician cities like Tyre and Sidon. And Jezebel had persuaded Ahab and most of Israel to accept the worship of these Tyrian gods, Baal and Asherah. And so this was embraced in Israel's religious life. And many people in Israel embraced this idolatry wholeheartedly. And they said, we're going to worship Baal, we're going to worship Asherah, we're going to worship other false gods, and we're still going to worship Yahweh to some degree. And at the same time, Jezebel had set out to kill all the prophets of Yahweh because she wanted to make Israel's worship exclusive to her false gods. And eventually, Yahweh sent his prophet Elijah to pass judgment on Israel for these grave sins of idolatry. Elijah announced to Ahab, there's not going to be any rain. There's not going to even be dew on the ground for the next three years. And that's exactly what happened. This pervasive drought and subsequent famine spread across the land as God's judgment for Israel's idolatry. And then three years later, Ahab, Jezebel, and the people still had not repented of this idolatry. So God sent Elijah to Ahab again. This time, Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to a showdown to prove to Israel that Yahweh was the only true God. So this was his pitch. He said, listen, let's go up to Mount Carmel. We'll both build altars of stone. We'll both put wood on that altar. We'll both sacrifice an ox will carve up the meat and put it on the altar, and then we'll both pray to our respective gods, and whichever one's God sends fire down from the heavens to consume the sacrifice, that'll be the proof positive that that's the true God. And the prophets of Baal accepted the challenge, and the people of Israel said, that sounds like a fair competition to us. We're, we're in it. And it's implied, if you prove to us that Yahweh is the only true God, we'll stop worshiping Baal, and we'll start worshiping Yahweh again. So the showdown happens, and it's this really awesome story. I mean, it's a biographical, real thing that happened. These 450 prophets of Baal, they go first, and so they chant and they dance, and they cut themselves, and they shed their blood on the altar. They do this all day long. And they pray, and they jump, and they dance, and they shout, and nothing happens. And Elijah, he just kind of mocks them throughout the day. He says, where's your God? Maybe he's asleep. You should shout louder and try to wake him up. Maybe he's busy doing something else. Maybe he's sitting on the toilet. That's what the Living Bible paraphrase says. Maybe he's on the toilet. And the first time I read that, I thought, what? That sounds like something I would write, you know? But the scholars are divided about this Hebrew word that's used because it's only used this one time in the Bible. And some scholars say it just means busy. It just means occupied. While others say, no, it was a euphemism for busy relieving oneself, as in the bathroom is occupied, right? So all day long, these prophets of Baal are giving it their all. Nothing happens. Elijah continues to trash talk them. And then finally at 3 p.m., the time of the evening sacrifice, it's Elijah's turn. So Elijah builds his altar, and he puts his wood on it, and he puts his sacrifice on it, and then he digs a trench all around the altar. And then he has the people of Israel soak this altar down with water. I mean, pitcher after pitcher after pitcher after pitcher of water. So much water, it even fills the trench around the altar. And Elijah's just being clear, there's no tricks involved here. It's going to take divine fire to burn this soaking wet sacrifice and this soaking wet wood. 
and there's no shouting, there's no dancing, there's no bleeding. Elijah just prays this really quiet and simple prayer. Let's read about it. It's at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near. And here was his prayer. Here's what he said. O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. And I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. And God immediately sends fire down from heaven. And it doesn't just light the wood on fire. It consumes the meat. It consumes the wood. It consumes the stones. It evaporates all the water in an instant. And the people of Israel begin to chant allegiance to Yahweh. They say, Yahweh, He is God. Yahweh, He is God. And Elijah then has them take all the 450 captive, uh, prophets of Baal captive, and he has them put them to death. And then as kind of a victory lap, Elijah goes back up on the mountaintop and he prays that the rains will return to Israel after having been gone for three years. And all at the prayers of Elijah, these things happen right as he prays them to happen. King Ahab has to rush home in his chariot to stay ahead of this massive rainstorm that's coming. And the Bible says Elijah runs even faster than the horse red chariot, and he beats Elijah, beats uh, Ahab back to Jezreel, the capital city at the time. And you read that and you go, wow. I mean, where, where is the Hollywood blockbuster movie about that, right? I mean, what an exciting action adventure story. That's definitely one of my favorite Old Testament biographical stories. So when Ahab gets back home, he tells Jezebel everything that's happened, everything Elijah has done. And he tells her how all the people chanted, Yahweh is God, Yahweh is God. And how Elijah had them kill all the 450 prophets of Baal. And so we wonder, did Ahab and Jezebel get the message? Did they repent of their idolatrous ways, realize they were worshiping false gods, and instead turn to worship the one true God, the creator of all that is, Yahweh? No. Jezebel responded by sending a messenger to Elijah to say this, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as one of the prophets of Baal you killed by tomorrow about this time. In other words, I have put a hit out on your life, Elijah. I am going to kill you in the next 24 hours. And so how did Elijah, our hero, the cool under pressure, tough as nails, miracle working, false prophet killing, great prophet of God respond to the threat of this wicked queen? He was afraid and rose and ran for his life. And we go, what? He did what? That's surprising, isn't it? I mean, why would he do that? Well, I don't know if you've ever had anybody threaten to kill you, but I have. I have. So I can speak with authority as to what this news must have felt like to Elijah. In fact, I could spend about 30 minutes telling you several very exciting stories of several death threats I've received over the years. The best story of all involves a sheriff's SWAT team in full body armor arriving at our church in Ohio while I was preaching, and I had to stop preaching. The praise band had to come up and cover for me while I went out to the lobby to file formal charges on the guy who had threatened to kill me and the rest of the church when he showed up at the church that day. And I don't remember what song the band played when I left the platform, but I think it would have been awesome if they played Let's all go to the lobby, let's all go to the lobby, let's all go to the lobby and talk to the officers of SWAT, right? So I get out there and there's this big burly sergeant in his full body armor. I'm like, what is going on? So if you want to hear the rest of that story, ask me and I'll tell you. Uh, Over the years, Annette and I have also had our tires slashed, our mail shredded, a window shot out. I've experienced multiple death threats from people who don't like Christians, who don't like pastors, who don't like churches. Exciting stuff. No time to share all that this morning. But suffice to say, I know exactly what Elijah felt like. 
And when someone like Jezebel promises you they're going to end your life in the next 24 hours, you take that threat very seriously. So this wasn't some irrational phobia for Elijah, right? This wasn't being scared of spiders laying eggs in your mouth while you sleep. Some people are afraid of that. I call that phobia arachno-oral ovophobia. I don't think... I don't think that's a real one, but that's the one I call it. And so this was actually an understandable response on Elijah's part to a very legitimate death threat from a very serious and very capable enemy who had a long history of doing that very thing. And it really is pretty clear that this catches Elijah off guard. This wasn't what he was expecting to happen at all because he had just proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that Yahweh was the only true God and that he, Elijah, was God's prophet. He was God's representative to the people of Israel. He he had proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so I think Elijah really believed it was game over and he had won. I, I think he really believed Ahab and Jezebel would repent and that they would embrace him and follow his leadership as he spoke for Yahweh. But instead, Jezebel says no. I'm going to murder you. And so what is Elijah's fear? He's not ready to die. Now, the Gallia County, Ohio SWAT team wasn't available for Elijah to call for protection, so he ran away. He just ran away. And still his reaction surprises us, doesn't it? Elijah, the prophet of God, who had experienced all of these miraculous acts of God through his life, He had raised a child from the dead. He had prayed for a three-year drought to occur. Then he prayed to make that drought end. He would prayed for and received fire from heaven. All of this occurred exactly how and exactly when he prayed for God to make it happen. So why wouldn't Elijah just assume that he could pray to God to protect him from Jezebel and it would happen? I mean, who needs SWAT when you have Yahweh? And after all he has seen and done, one person threatens to kill him, and he just freaks out. Why was he so full of fear? And then the story gets even stranger. He runs for a day out into the wilderness, and then he just collapses underneath a tree. And he's clearly mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically exhausted. And then there's this plot twist, because he prays for God to kill him. He says, it is enough now, Lord. Take my life. I'm not better than my father's. It's like, I have failed. Nothing I've done has made any difference. I quit, God. It's enough for me. Enough already. I'm ready to die. Now that's odd, right? Because he's terrified of Jezebel killing him. But then just a day later, he's actually asking God to snuff out his life. What's up with that? And I don't think he really means it. I I, I think he just doesn't want to die. He's just having kind of a nervous breakdown. Again, he clearly thought this was going to be victory lap time. He thought he was going to be embraced as a man of God by Ahab, Jezebel, and all of Israel. After this amazing Mount Carmel victory, I think he was just kind of expecting an ESPN reporter to step up and say, Elijah, congratulations. You've just defeated the prophets of Baal and brought about the complete repentance of all of Israel, including King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. They're sorry for how they acted. Everyone's going to live happily ever after, worshiping Yahweh as the one true God. Elijah, what are you going to do next? And he was all set to say, I'm going to Disney World, right? But that's not what happened. Nothing seems to have changed at all. People had all shouted for Yahweh, but now it was clear they were just going to go back to living like they were before because Jezebel and Ahab didn't want them to worship Yahweh. And so Elijah's looking ahead in his life and he's realizing, man, I'm going to be in this battle for the rest of my life. I'm going to be feeling all this stress, feeling all these threats, feeling all this fear for the rest of my life. I quit. I quit. I give up. I, I, I wish I was already dead. And maybe some of you can relate to that sometimes, where there just doesn't seem to be any blue skies ahead for you. No matter how hard you try, things never seem to really get much better. And it becomes hard to see the forest for all of the trees. I quit. I give up. I've certainly said those words before in my life in times of frustration. I quit. I give up. I wish I was dead, right? And Elijah is just depressed. He's 
just discouraged. He's tired of fighting. He feels like he's all alone in this. And so he's ready to give up. He's afraid of what is a very real threat of a torturous and painful death from the forces of his evil enemy. And this shouldn't really surprise us because Elijah was a human being, just like you and just like me. James, the brother of Jesus, tells us that. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was just a human being. James goes on to say he was used in these mighty ways by God, but he was just a man with a nature like ours. Sometimes life got the better of him. I mentioned last week, I'm glad the Bible shows us our heroes of the faith in all of their unvarnished human imperfections. Elijah didn't always get it right. And sometimes even the great biblical heroes doubted, and they were paralyzed by fear. Now, it's interesting because God doesn't force Elijah back into the game right away. He lets Elijah go rest under a juniper bush. And God comforts and feeds Elijah. He helps him rest. He helps him sleep. And when Elijah wakes up from this napping and eats a second time, he's got all this strength again, and he runs away again. And this time he, he runs for 40 days and 40 nights. He runs all the way to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, also known as Mount Sinai. This is the same mountain where Moses first encountered Yahweh in a burning bush. This is the same mountain where the Israelites first met Yahweh as he descended on the mountaintop in fire and smoke. And so on one level, Elijah, I think, is doing what we should all do when we feel fear. He's running toward God. He's running toward the mountain of God. And that's what the local church is in our time, isn't it? We call this the a house of God, but it's also kind of the mountain of God. Right, And when the world gets too much for us, when we begin to feel fear and discouragement and exhaustion, when we begin to feel defeated, we should always run to God. We should always run to the mountain of God to commune with Him, to worship Him, to draw courage and wisdom and strength from Him. Now, a hundred years after Elijah's time, that's the kind of renewal the prophet Isaiah spoke about. He said, those who wait for the Lord's help find renewed strength. They rise up as if they had eagle's wings. They run without growing weary. They walk without getting tired. Now, of course, as a prophet of God, Elijah knows this as well. But in the midst of his emotional turmoil, he just isn't thinking this way. He's not thinking clearly. He's thinking everything depends on on me. He's forgotten that God is the one who's really in control. And now he's terrified Jezebel is going to take him out. He feels disconnected from God. He feels like he's all alone. He feels like he has to fight her by himself. And I know that because when he gets to the mountain of God, he just hides. He just hides. Elijah effectively seals himself in a tomb-like cave with a stone of fear. We read in 1 Kings 19.9, Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now I want you to hear this question with a father's love. It's not a harsh question. It's not a scolding question. It's a loving nudge by a heavenly father who knows what's best for Elijah and who knows what's best for his overall plan for his people. And here he sees Elijah hiding in fear instead of doing what God has called him and gifted him to do in faith, trusting that God will make a way for him even when there seems to be no way. And the scripture says the word of the Lord came to him to ask this question. Who is the word of the Lord? Jesus. Right? And so he asks Elijah, hey, buddy, what's going on? Why are you hiding in this cave? You want to talk about it? And Elijah answers. And I think he said all this as kind of a giant run-on sentence through sobs and tears, barely taking a breath. If you've ever spoken to an upset toddler or even an upset teenager, it often sounds a little like this. Elijah said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant and they torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword and I alone am left and they seek my life to take it away. <laughs> right? What's he really saying? He's saying, God, 
I feel like I did everything right. I feel like I did everything you told me to do. I feel like I said everything you told me to say. I've been very zealous. I've worked tirelessly. And now I look around and I go, what was it all for? I made no difference. No one is really repenting. No one is really following you. My ministry hasn't really accomplished anything of lasting value. And throughout all of it, I've watched others like me get murdered by Jezebel one after the other. And now I'm the only one left. Nothing has changed. Jezebel is still in power, and now she's going to kill me too. It's all been for nothing. I'm all by myself, right? And again, I think it's clear that Elijah is just suffering from emotional fatigue and isolation. He's also badly misunderstood God's will. He has misjudged the impact of his own ministry. And that's why he's now having this major crisis of faith. I think he really expected Ahab and Jezebel to repent and to follow Yahweh when presented with that overwhelming evidence on Mount Carmel, and they did not. He thought that was his responsibility to get these people to change, to get these people to repent, to get these people to grow closer to God. He thought that was his job. It wasn't. And so it's clear God wants Elijah to continue in this prophetic ministry he's been called to. There's still more to do. And it doesn't all rest on Elijah. It all rests on God. Elijah just needs to do what God tells him to do and trust that God will bring about the results he wants. But Elijah says what he feels in that moment, and it's not true, but this is what he feels. He says, I alone am left. He's saying, I'm the only prophet of God left, but he's also saying, I'm the only believer left in all of Israel. I'm the only one who really gets it and wants to serve you. And he's convinced that he's doing all of this on his own. It's no wonder he's exhausted. It's no wonder he's afraid. He's been so busy in the work of the Lord that he has forgotten the Lord of the work. He's forgotten a key promise of God when it comes to this emotion of fear. 400 years before Elijah's time, God spoke to Joshua and the people of Israel, and he said this, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. That's the context of this command to not be afraid. God repeats this to Joshua directly after Moses got, dies, right? Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Therefore, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. And then God says it again in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 41. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now listen, don't miss this. Listen, these promises are made to you and me as well. The author of Hebrews tells all Christians, he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Why should we not be afraid? Because God is always with us. God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. God will help us. God will strengthen us. God will up hold us. How does God remove the stone of fear in our lives? Fear leaves us and courage returns as soon as we remember we are never alone. As soon as we fully realize God is always with us, always for us, will never leave us, never forsake us, strengthen us, help us, uphold us. That's why we don't need to be afraid. And so God removes the stone of fear from our life as soon as we turn to him and trust him. So it was a normal human reaction for Elijah to fear for his life and run. We can all relate to that. But now God needed to teach this important lesson to Elijah as well. Elijah is never 
alone. God is still with him. And in fact, God will show him in a minute, there's still other believers in Israel too. You're not the last one. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Look, the Lord is ready to pass by. A very powerful wind went before the Lord, digging into the mountain and causing landslides. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the windstorm, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a soft whisper. You say, okay, what is all that about? What is God teaching Elijah and what is God teaching us here? Elijah had already experienced God in massive events like this before, right? Things like earthquakes and floods and winds and fire, big visible miracles that had already been a part of Elijah's experience with God. So that was his expectation of the presence and support of God, that it always had to come in that type of massive, nature-bending, supernatural, miraculous expression. For Elijah, if fire wasn't literally falling from heaven to solve his problem, then God wasn't there at all, and he was in this situation all alone, and that's why he felt inadequate for the task. But here, just outside of the cave on Mount Horeb, God shows Elijah and shows us that while he does sometimes appear in those kind of huge, loud, astounding ways, he most often comes to us instead as a soft whisper. In Hebrew, it says a kaw damama daka, a still, small voice, a soft, gentle whisper. And so as God told Moses and Joshua and the people of Israel, he's also telling Elijah, do not be afraid. Even when you don't see me, even when nothing visibly miraculous is being observed by you, know that I am still with you because I'm always with you. I am always for you. My perfect love cannot be overcome. I'm not only in the big, visible, miraculous things that you love to see. I'm also in the minutia. I'm in the everyday things. I'm always closer than a whisper away to you. You're never alone. I'm always with you. I'm always for you. I will never leave you or forsake you. So God says to you, and God says to me today, listen for my soft, gentle whisper. And don't assume that I'm only around when fire falls from heaven. Don't be afraid. So what happened with Elijah when this whisper of God came to him? It says, when Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his robe and went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. Why did he do that? Because Elijah recognizes God's voice. So he veils his face as a gesture of respect and awe and to shield himself from the overwhelming holiness and glory of God. And he recognizes he's not just hearing the voice of God as if God is far away and just calling down to him from the heavens, right? It's not a cell phone call. When he hears the voice of God, he realizes he is actually in the presence of God. The God is not way far off in heaven only sending down supernatural signs, God is actually with him. He's always closer than a whisper away. So Elijah encounters God as Emmanuel, a name that means God with us. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, Elijah has already been asked this question once before by God. And he answered it honestly the first time. It was clear the reason he was there was to have a pity party for himself. He was there because he had bought the lie of the enemy that he was all alone and that he was about to be defeated. And God has shown Elijah, you're never alone. I am always with you. And so God asks the question again. With this new knowledge, with this new awareness of me, I'm asking you the question again, why did you come to this cave, Elijah? And Elijah responds with the exact same words as he did the first time. Now, it's not that God expected a different answer. He wants Elijah to revisit his reasons 
for what brought him to this cave in the first place. But now, with the added perspective he's just received, Elijah repeats his answer verbatim. And we can't know for sure, but I think his tone and his cadence are different. He says, why did I end up in this cave? Because I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And that is indeed the reason Elijah is here in the cave. This is still an honest answer. This was the mindset that brought him here to this place. But now he must know how wrong that conclusion is. That he isn't alone at all. These were the emotions that overwhelmed me, Father. This was the fear that drove me to hide in this place. But now that I've heard your gentle whisper, now that I've heard your still small voice of assurance, I'm ready to get back to work. I'm ready to fulfill the purpose that you have in my life. I'm no longer afraid. So tell me what to do. It doesn't say any of that, but I think that's what's implied in Elijah's answer, because I believe context is everything. God knows Elijah's heart, and God doesn't have to say anything or do anything else to try to convince Elijah. The very next verse, God just gives Elijah his next assignment, and Elijah immediately leaves the cave of fear, ready to go do it and get back to work. Half time is over. And the Lord said to him, go return. This is a command of repentance. Go Return. Stop what you're doing. Return back to what you're supposed to be doing. You've wandered off the path. Go return on your way. Here's what God said. Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazel, king over Aram. And Yehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. You're going to go find your successor. It shall come about the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel, Yehu, shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Yehu, Elisha, shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel. All the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So again, God's message is, Elijah, I know you feel like you're alone. But you're the last one left. But you're not alone. Not only am I with you, I'm going to add some additional prophets and kings that you're going to anoint that will serve me. And there's a remnant of 7,000 people in Israel who still serve me, who don't worship Baal. Elijah, you're not alone. You're never alone. It's not all on you. Don't be afraid. And so Elijah did what God told him to do. And he went out and he anointed Elisha as a prophet. And he trained this young man as his successor. And Elisha is there when Elijah is taken straight up to heaven in a whirlwind. And Elisha picks up Elijah's mantle and begins his own ministry as a prophet of God. And I think it's really interesting that Elijah's great fear was the fear of death. And he didn't even have to experience it. He was taken directly up to heaven in a whirlwind without ever dying. We love that idea, yeah? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die, amen? And so as we pull all this together this morning, let's look at one event from the life of Elijah's protege, Elisha, who clearly learned from Elijah that he also was never alone, that God was always with him, and there was no need to fear. First, a little bit of context. The king of a nation called Aram was at war now with Israel. And God, in his still small voice, kept telling Elisha what the king of Aram's battle plans against Israel were. And Elisha would just go tell the king of Israel. And so the king of Israel kept escaping from these battle plans of Aram. And time and time again, the king of Aram's plans get thwarted. And he searches for a traitor amongst his leadership, but he finds out there's no traitor. There's nobody, a spy, uh, sharing uh, confidential information. There's only the prophet Elisha, who is being notified supernaturally by God what the king of Aram's plans are. So the king of Aram puts out a hit on Elisha in a similar way to Jezebel's hit 
on Elijah. And they find out he's in the city called Dothan. And the king of Aram sends his horses, his chariots, a great army to surround the city so that he can kill this meddling prophet. Now the next morning, Elisha's servant got up early and he went out probably to pick up coffee and pastries from Dothan Bucks. Just seeing if you're still paying attention. And here's what happened. Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, Behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to Elisha, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Now, that sounds very poetic. Alas, my master, what shall we do? I think the author's taking a little bit of poetic license. I think if we'd have been there that day, we'd have heard the dude actually say, Ah, holy moly, what are we going to do? Right? And so Elisha comes out to see what the screaming is about, and he observes the same thing. Surrounded by a vast army of soldiers and charioteers. And Elisha observes this, and but he has learned how to remove the stone of fear from his mentor, Elijah. And he gives this answer to his servant's question. What are we going to do? He answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with us. Them. We don't know what the servant said in response, but I think he probably said, man, are you tripping? Were, were those magic mushrooms in your mushroom omelet this morning? Ain't nobody here with us, brother. We're all alone. This servant had the same mindset as Elijah when he was hiding out in the cave. And so what's Elisha do? He prayed and said, oh, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, I guarantee you, if you had been in that position and Elisha had said that prayer for you and your spiritual eyes were open and you saw how powerful the forces of God were on your behalf, you wouldn't feel any fear either. That's the lesson Elisha's servant Learned. It's the same lesson we've talked about several times already this morning. We're never alone. God is always with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will strengthen us. He will uphold us. There are always more with us than against us. And then Elisha prays that this opposing army will be struck blind. And they are. And then they're taken captive. They're led to the king of Israel where they're treated kindly. They're fed then their sight is restored and they're returned to the king of Aram, which brings about peace between Aram and Israel. So now listen, don't miss this. If you came in here this morning with any fear tearing away at your heart, if you came in this morning feeling all alone in this world, wondering if God is still with you, if God is still supporting you, if God still loves you, if God still has a plan and a purpose for your life, if you're feeling lately like having a pity party, cave trapped by a stone of fear like Elijah was, if you're fixated on everything that's against you right now and you're feeling overwhelmed with fear, I'm just going to pray for you this morning that God will open your spiritual eyes so that you can see what Elijah and Elisha saw. That God would open your spiritual ears so that you can hear what Elijah and Elisha saw. The still, small voice of God gently whispering to you. To assure you that you are never alone. He will never leave you or forsake you. So you have nothing to fear. Even when we're clearly under attack by our enemy, if you and I could see into the spirit realm, we would see that there are always more for us than there are against us. So let God remove the stone of fear from your life this morning. Be strong. Be courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. The Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Amen? Let's pray as uh, Joel comes to lead us in our closing worship. God, we can all relate on some level to Elijah, feeling like we've given some big task our all, and then things just didn't turn out the way we thought they would didn't turn out the way we hoped they would. 
We feel exhausted, we feel run down, we feel empty. And sometimes we feel depressed, we feel discouraged, we feel like quitting, giving up. We feel like we're all alone, that there's nobody else helping us. But God, we realize that's just lies of our enemy, the devil. Those are lies. They aren't true. We have your promise that we are never alone, that there are always more with us than against us, that you, God, will never leave us or forsake us, that you will uphold us, that you will strengthen us, that you will help us. So God, I pray for all of us today who might be experiencing fear of something unknown in our life, or fear of some known thing that we know is a real threat to us, to our safety, to our happiness, to our future. And God, I pray that we would still come towards that fear, not running away from it, but step right up to it, knowing that you are greater than whatever it is that's threatening us, and that we can put our faith and trust in you, knowing we are never alone pray that for every single person here today, everyone watching online later, God, help them know you are with them and they're never alone. That's my prayer for all of us today in Jesus' name. Amen.